Well, good morning. Welcome. Great to see all of you to what I think is in a continuing series of very important lectures, a very, very important lecture. Um, and ironically, could not be more timely. It's always timely, but could not be more, I guess, politically timely in ways that we certainly were never able to anticipate. Um, I'm Richard Abor. I'm president of the Crime Commission. Welcome to some new friends, and certainly welcome to all of you who have come back and are coming back to a number of our events. We really appreciate uh, your attendance and your support. So we are at the Sea Level Cafe, which is housed within the Emigrant Bank Complex, and it's my honor to introduce to you the host for this morning, Howard Milstein. Now, many of you have already heard me talk about Howard, and I'm going to try and not review some of the things that I've told you in the past. And Howard actually makes that easy, believe it or not. You know, some people, if you introduce them three or four times, you end up going over the same three or four things. With Howard, you give him a couple of months, and you got three or four new things to talk about. And that, and that has happened in just a continuing display of his civic involvement, his enormous philanthropy, and his business interests. Just in the last 30 days, we'll pick, um, he has been to China because he has set up a very active partnership between Asian countries and the United States to promote health care between us, which is a fantastic thing to be doing. Howard has a long and deep interest in health care issues. Does a lot of work with the New York Blood Center, which is now spreading out across the country as a facilitator of transfers and is doing some very interesting research in that regard, particularly around the use of stem cells. Stuff that we literally, you know, we all use this term, but this is literally life-saving uh, research and duly recognized. And we're very, very proud of that. He was relatively recently, not in the last 30 days, but pushed me back to 40, inducted into the French Legion of Honor, which if you follow French politics at all or know much about France, is the highest honor that France bestows on uh, citizens, non-military, non-government officials, richly deserved for promoting cultural exchanges between the United States and France. And as you know, his, his connection, his contact, his deep roots with many of us in this room, but certainly throughout the public safety apparatus of the city, is long, long, long known and goes way back, in including actually, ironically, on immigration. Um, I think 10 years ago now, he worked on a publication which he got published called The Immigrant's Guide to New York. New York can be challenging enough for those of us that grew up here, let alone for people who are just coming who may not speak the language. He had that book put together and published in a number of languages. The bank has sponsored awards to people that lead immigrant groups. You know, I can just go on and on and on. If there were a modern day philanthropic renaissance man, it would be Howard. It's just terrific. And I guess to get the real sense of Howard, you just look at the people that work with him, the great people that are here this morning. They are always incredibly professional, incredibly efficient, and incredibly graceful. And that's Howard through and through, and that's a reflection. Howard, thank you so much, and may I ask you to introduce the judge. Well, it's not that easy to get me to blush. <laughs> but I think you've achieved it. Uh, on uh, one bit of good news for all of you, uh, which since you probably are pursuing other fields of interest, including the one that we all share an interest in uh, this morning, uh, this partnership that we've worked out, particularly with China and the Ministry of Health in uh, six areas of medicine, uh, is going to focus on taking the stem cell technology that we developed at the New York Blood Center, which is saving about 5,000 lives a year in the United States now, uh, which uses, M uses cord blood. So babies born, umbilical cord, thrown away. Well, no longer we find that there are very valuable stuff in there called stem cells. And these stem cells uh, are now being used as a substitute for bone marrow. So the people who couldn't find a bone marrow match uh, throughout the United States and throughout the world now find it with that. But the thing that's interesting, the good news is uh, that although uh, our product was the first licensed by the FDA as any stem cell therapy in the United States, uh, and but for this limited purpose, ultimately this technology will give uh, doctors the capability uh, through uh, something called regenerative medicine to repair or replace any organ in the human body. 
So, uh, go ahead and have the scrambled eggs. <laughs> Don't worry about the cholesterol. We're on it. It's a special honor to welcome the Honorable Chief Judge Robert Katzman to today's breakfast forum. Judge Katzman has led a life of public service, first educating and inspiring our country's bright young minds at Georgetown, and thereafter through enhancing the U.S. judicial system. Judge Katzman's illustrious career began with his clerkship on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit and moved to the highly regarded Brookings Institutions where he served in various positions of increasing responsibility. In addition to being the current Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, he is Chair of the U.S. Judicial Conference Committee on, judi on the Judicial Branch. And, is Judge Katz and Judge Katzman is a published author as well. Most recently, Oxford University Press released his book, Judging Statutes, a critique of the textualist approach to statutory interpretation. One of Judge Katzman's most notable contributions is his crucial work in providing judicial access for our country's immigrant population. He was instrumental in establishing the Immigrant Justice Corps, which connects recent law school and college graduates to immigrants in need of legal services, a program that received more than a million dollars in funding uh, just at its inception. In fact, his work in immigrant legal services has earned him the Michael Maggio Memorial Pro Bono Award of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Providing pro bono legal services to needy populations resonates with me because my wife, it's exactly what my wife, uh, Abby, is so devoted to as chairman of the New York Legal Assistance Group, and I see we're very well represented here this morning. The bank we gather in this morning was founded to help immigrants. Just as Judge Katzman has provided access to the justice system, our bank, Emigrant, was founded in 1850 to provide Irish immigrants with access to the financial system, a proud tradition that we have upheld through the generations. Immigrant access to our judicial system is an issue that is becoming ever more important as immigration reform becomes more central in our political process and public discourse. With refugee crises of unprecedented proportions and mounting instability in the world, our country remains the go-to aspiration for immigrants. Judge Katzman has been at the forefront of the issue for quite some time, and I salute his commitment. Judge Katzman, it's a privilege to have you join us this morning. So, thank you, Howard, for that. Uh, very gracious introduction. Uh, like everyone in this room, I am an admirer of the uh, good works of the uh, Milstein family in so many different areas. And uh, in fact, it was in, the conne in connection with immigration, uh, with NILAG, uh, that we first, uh, we first met. So, so delighted to be here. I uh, thank uh, Richard A. Bourne, most distinguished lawyer, for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's great to see Chief. It's great to see Chief Judge Preska. Can you hear me? It's great to it's great to see uh, Chief Judge Preska here as well. Um, and um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak about issues having to do with immigrant uh, representation. Um, when I first uh, became a judge uh, on the Second Circuit uh, in 1999 the immigration docket of the Court of Appeals was, uh, was, was minuscule. There were just a few cases uh, here and there. Uh, and um, after 9-11 uh, after especially, uh, the Im immigration docket of the Second Circuit uh, increased to at one point being 40 percent of the docket of, of, uh, of the Second Circuit as a whole. And all too often, uh, I had the feeling and my colleagues had the feeling that uh, the immigrants were not being uh, well represented at all. Oftentimes, we would see uh, briefs that were, were boilerplate, really substandard uh, in all too many cases, 
what would we, we would see is that um, all that would change from brief to brief in many cases were just the name. Uh, and sometimes the name would be inconsistent. They didn't have it go through the, the uh, trouble of even changing the name consistently. And we had the sense that uh, in all too many cases that if only there had been a good lawyer, the uh, outcome would have been different. And, um, uh, and, and what's of, at stake, of course, is whether families can stay together. Uh, whether that where the parents will be separated from their their children, um, from their loved ones, and so uh, I wanted to do something uh, about it because I did have this this sense that good lawyering could make make a difference, and that the problem really had to be addressed long before something came to the uh, to the court of appeals because by the time a case gets to the court of appeals, it's often too late because often we're, we're reviewing uh, essentially factual findings. And uh, there are standards, as you know, of deference owed. Uh, and so if the record is not made below at the very outset of the proceedings, the uh, immigrants' chances of prevailing uh, are uh, severely diminished. And it, it seems that just as a matter of uh, the administration of justice that all would benefit from having a good lawyer. The uh, non-citizen benefits, the immigrant benefits, but also the administration of justice benefits because when you have good lawyering it makes it easier for all those adjudicating cases and actually there are uh, efficiencies in terms of cost savings to that system where, uh, um, where there's that kind of uh, representation. So I wanted to do something about it. I took the opportunity in 2007 delivering the uh, Martin Lecture of the New York City Bar, the invitation of uh, Pete I Eikenberry, um, to uh, try to shine a light on this problem and to uh, challenge the uh, legal establishment, the uh, whole legal establishment, to do something about this. And I wasn't sure what sort of uh, reaction there would be, but the reaction has been really um, very uh, extraordinary. In New York, of course, we are blessed because we have so many organizations that are devoted to this cause, uh, like NILAG. Um, so I started a, um, a study group, the study group on immigrant uh, representation, and uh, with lots of great people like, like Bob Jusseum. Um, we started this study group and, and what we, we have is, is, a, is a group of some 70 lawyers from uh, law firms, from uh, uh, law schools, from uh, nonprofits, from immigrant uh, legal services providers. Uh, we have uniquely federal, state, and local government also participating. Uh, actors who are often uh, in adversary situations during the day when we meet in the early mornings um, in the courthouse are working together trying to achieve um, solutions. It's been a, a true honor to work with these extraordinary lawyers to, to uh, help those in need. And we've, we focused on three uh, specific areas, increasing pro bono activity of firms, especially at, uh, at the outset of immigration proceedings, improving mechanisms of legal services delivery, and rooting out inadequate counsel and improving the quality of representation available uh, to non-citizens. We've had many initiatives, uh, and I want to uh, highlight the Immigrant Justice Corps and also mention the uh, New York Immigrant Family Unity Project. But first, just a catalog of some of our act activities. We've undertaken uh, data-driven studies. Uh, Senator Moynihan, a great mentor of mine, uh, likes to say that uh, you are uh, entitled to your own opinion, but not to your own facts. And so uh, we wanted to get the data. And um, with the uh, help of the, uh, the Vera Institute, we undertook a study, the New York Immigrant Representation Study which was the first ever comprehensive data-driven 
uh, examination of the, the needs of, uh, of, of, of immigrants, legal needs in New York. And the data were really quite striking. I think anecdotally, none of this will surprise you, but you actually just see the data. It's very striking. Um, so if you are represented and released or never de detained, 74% have successful outcomes. That's an extraordinary figure. But if you are unrepresented, 13% have successful outcomes. Now in detention cases, if you are represented but detained, 18% have successful outcomes. If you are unrepresented and detained, 3% have successful outcomes. Disquietingly, a survey that we undertook uh, of the uh, immigrant, uh, immigration judges uh, in New York um, showed that nearly half of all legal representatives are inadequate in terms of uh, overall performance. That's an assessment of the of the immigration judges themselves. Now, our study just didn't wind up on a shelf. Our findings about the scope of the need were published in 2011 and were followed by a report in 2012 that set forth a solution to address this need. And that resulted in the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, NIFA. NIFA is the country's first system of institutionally provided deportation defense using an assigned counsel model. A small group of competitively selected uh, providers, the uh, Legal Aid Society, uh, Bronx Defenders, uh, Brooklyn Legal Services, uh, is, is providing counsel to those in detention. And because of the support of the uh, New York City Council, uh, Every person in detention in New York City, at least for this, this coming year, will have access to legal representation. And the, uh, the judges in the system, the immigration judges, think this is really working very well. Because sometimes what happens is, for example, uh, an immigrant is convinced that there is no point to uh, continuing appeals in, in, in deportation uh, in these proceedings and the case will end sooner. Other times, because of having good lawyering, the detainee will have a, a good result for him and for his, his family. What we're talking about is, is just making sure that there is access to justice, that justice should not depend on the income level of, 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 of immigrants. We've done, so that's NIFA. Uh, we've done a lot of other kinds of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of initiatives working with the bar. I want to focus on the, uh, the other initiative, and that is the, the Immigrant uh, Justice Corps. This is a, an initiative that um, I had been thinking about for, for many years. The IJC uh, was launched in January 2014 with substantial planning support and uh, initial funding from the Robin Hood Foundation. It uh, also has substantial support from the JPB Foundation and uh, some eight other uh, foundations uh, from law firms, from bar groups. The, the IJC is the nation's first fellowship program wholly dedicated to meeting the needs for legal assistance for immigrants seeking citizenship and fighting deportation. The concept of the IJC is based on the supposition that the need for effective counsel for immigrants will only increase in the years ahead. Fiscal circumstances are tight and adequate public support for counsel will be difficult to realize on a national level. And in that climate, the fair and effective administration of justice will depend upon thinking about how to supplement uh, whatever resources uh, may be available. So, Take, take administrative relief. Uh, if there is some sort of administrative relief, uh, at least some portion of those who may be eligible will need good lawyering. Uh, and for some, depending on how the process works, it may be easier than others. So whatever reforms we have in the future, uh, we're going to need more lawyering that is good rather than less that whether it's comprehensive reform legislation or administrative relief, 
the need for good lawyering will, will only increase. And we've seen that, for example, with respect to unaccompanied children, some 4,700 unaccompanied children, uh, because of the, the, the work of, uh, of, of uh, some of the people in this room, like NILAC, um, and law firms and other resources, uh, there is the hope that every unaccompanied children in the New York area will have, will have representation. Um, so the Immigrant Justice Corps, which is also devoting part of its uh, resources to unaccompanied children, uh, consists of, of these young lawyers, recent uh, law school uh, graduates or recently out of, of clerkships, come from throughout the country. They come to New York City. We're piloting in New York City. It's a national program, but we're piloting in, in New York City. And they work with nonprofit uh, providers. They add capacity to those nonprofit uh, providers. Uh, we have, in addition, uh, young college graduates who are serving in community-based organizations. For example, a lot of immigrants will go to uh, the Brooklyn Public Library. Um, and, at, and look for uh, help. Um, well, what we're doing is we're providing uh, these paralegals who are under the direction of, of trained lawyers to basically guide immigrant, these immigrants. In a lot of these cases, you're talking about people with, with very worthy claims. Uh, they're not criminals. Uh, it's often uh, children who didn't even know of their uh, lack of status. Uh, they've been here for years, or 16, 17 uh, years of age, whatever. Um, so uh, next year we'll have uh, 50 lawyers in the field. In the, in the third year, we'll have about 75 uh, lawyers, uh, uh, in, in the, up to 75 lawyers in the field, plus uh, 50 or, or, or 60 uh, young uh, college graduates. When you look at the lawyers, they're all very committed. Many of them have uh, uh, immigrant uh, families themselves. Many, many of them are immigrants themselves. The same with the, these college uh, graduates, uh, often first generation uh, Americans. These are people who really know how to speak uh, to the immigrant uh, community. So what will happen? You're going to create a cadre of really excellent lawyers. Now, there are many excellent immigration lawyers now, but we need to uh, supplant that part of the immigration bar that is uh, inadequate, that is taking advantage, uh, stealing the resources of, of poor immigrants. Some of these lawyers will stay uh, as committed lawyers working in nonprofits. Others will go to law firms and will become leaders in their law firms to do more pro bono, to help NILAG and other organizations like that. Uh, some will be involved in, in uh, policy debates. It's all very, it's all, it seems to me, very exciting. We have a uh, terrific executive director, uh, Rachel Tibben, who uh, was the executive director of immigration equality. We have, a, have an excellent board led by uh, William Zabel. Uh, and um, if you want to know more about our activities, uh, we have a website, uh, justicecore.org, and uh, I invite you to look at that website and to become involved, to call me, to uh, email me, or, or get in touch with Rachel Tibben. Uh, we're especially interested in figuring out uh, ways to increase the involvement of the business community. Uh, in this work, because um, uh, when, a, when a, a corporation says to uh, a, uh, uh, a client, we think you should support NILAG or the Immigrant Justice Corps, they, they, they will actually listen. So um, corporations are important in all this. And I think that any lawyer who has uh, successfully represented a non-citizen can tell you about the extraordinary satisfaction of helping someone in need, about keeping a family together, about making it possible for people to realize the American dream in the same way that all of us here in this room 
have been able to realize the American dream. Uh, probably a good number of us in this room can, uh, can hear the accents and the voices of our parents, our grandparents. They came to this country to make this country even greater than it was so that their children could have every opportunity. And so when we try to help uh, immigrants, when we try to help these families with worthy claims, we're not just making sure that the administration of justice works better, we're really being faithful and honoring the past, uh, our family's past. And so it's something that I obviously feel uh, very strongly about uh, we're in the process now of, uh, of, of going national uh, on a variety of our projects. Uh, we have a uh, colloquium coming up at uh, Cardozo on November 21st. And so I'm very excited about these uh, initiatives. And uh, it's only fitting that um, I have the opportunity to talk to you these uh, 15 minutes in this bank. Uh, first, because of this bank's heritage and its commitment, and also because of the continuing uh, commitment of the, uh, the Milstein family to uh, securing justice for those in need. So, thank you very much. Uh, His Honor will take some questions. If you is that a hand or a camera? It's a, it's a camera. You just bought the bank. That was a bid. <laughs> His Honor will take some questions if you have any. They tend to be shy. I'm just telling okay. you in advance. You know, Peter Kugasian Come on, Peter. He's a guy who really knows how to ask a good question. That's right. <laughs> well, he actually asks trick questions. Right? Yeah. He asks trick questions. He's also a great magician. Yeah, that's why I said it. Yeah, exactly. Um, you mentioned uh, the tragedy of lawyers who are taking advantage of immigrants and not providing services, and sometimes I've heard even making their situation worse off than if they had no lawyer, because sometimes they bring them to the attention of, of immigration authorities when that's not in their interest. What can the bench and the bar and, and, and your organization do to, frankly, get them out of the immigration business? It's a great question. The question is, uh, what do you do about these uh, terrible lawyers? How do we get them out of the system? Uh, one thing that, that that your office, the Manhattan DA's office, pioneered it, pioneered in uh, when uh, Robert Morgenthau was DA, was the creation of, a, of an office that tries to uh, help root out these lawyers. And there's, there are actually hotlines uh, that can be called. <clears throat> the problem for most uh, non-citizens is that they are, they are afraid. And so even though a hotline exists, how do you uh, break into that, that uh, those barriers? Um, because many of them, of course, come from countries where they lived in fear. So they come to this country, and uh, they think that they're coming here doing all the right things. They're, they're brought over here by snakeheads. Uh, and then only to realize that they're actually in trouble, and they're, they're afraid. So I think one of the things that uh, we, we wanted to do is to uh, create community-based uh, places where uh, people who speak the language, lawyers who speak the language, paralegals who speak the language can be embedded in the community and create links to the, to the, to, to the community. I think that um, there are other additional things that can be done, for example, immigration judges don't have much authority uh, in terms of sanctioning lawyers. Um, it's a complicated situation, but uh, strengthening the capacity of, of uh, the immigration judges to uh, do these cases uh, would be helpful. The immigration judges, just to give you a sense, the immigration judges are uh, in the executive branch of government. Um, the immigration judges are on average, on average, on the bench, in the course of a week, 35 hours on the bench, just being on the bench. Uh, they have a, a caseload of 1,400 cases uh, a year per judge. These are heavy, record-intensive cases. 
if you compare the uh, resources of an immigration judge with that of, of a, uh, a federal judge, there's just no comparison. They have to share uh, one law clerk for every three judges. It used to be six. There are often problems of translation services. Um, so increasing resources for the immigration courts, I think, could be, could be useful. And um, an effort that we've been involved in, the study group uh, has been involved in, is working with, for example, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, working with uh, the local consumer affairs departments uh, in terms of, of and, and the Department of Justice, and having sweeps of against uh, lawyers involved in the unauthorized uh, practice of law. You, 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 and, you, and, 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 and NILAG knows all about this as we do, that um, all of us do is that, you know, you've got uh, some addresses, it's the same address, and it's like, you know, 60 lawyers it's a, it's, 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 who are uh, in so-called solo practice. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's the lawyers who are not doing the work who really need to be sanctioned and uh, brought to the attention of the disciplinary authorities. When you look at the um, cases that come uh, out of the federal courts involving discipline uh, in the Second Circuit, uh, a huge percentage of those cases uh, involve cases involving uh, immigration and uh, inadequate representation. Having, having, a, having a bad lawyer, as you say, Peter, can be uh, worse than having no lawyer. Because if you have no lawyer, and some, what an immigration judge will try to do often is just to help try to level the field. But when you have a lawyer, you know, you're, that's the lawyer you have. And um, if that lawyer is bad, it's, it's, uh, it's very unfortunate. It's tragic. Please, we just going to speak up a little bit. Yeah. Good morning, Judge Katzman. Uh, Steve Choi, Executive Director of the New York Immigration Coalition. I just want to thank you. We have more than 100 immigrant serving organizations as members here in New York City, and we've seen the impact that the IJC and NIFA has had. Uh, so I want to thank you for all that you've done. It's, it's been amazing. Thank you for all you're doing. <laughs> so my question really is about some of the equities regarding folks who are detained and folks who are not detained. This is something that's come up with some of our member agencies who have said, look, because of NIFA, I'm representing someone who's detained who actually doesn't have much of a case because they have several criminal convictions. And yet, we are obligated to continue representation of them. And I think one of the things that the unaccompanied minor situations brought up is that there is a tremendous need for representation of folks who are not detained. And so has there been a conversation within NIFA about some of those equities there versus, uh, in terms of providing representation of folks who are detained and those who are not detained and how to make sure that we're able to really fit the community need? NIFA, is, as you know, has been focused on, on detainees. And um, the, in, in an argument, a case that I've been making is that we have to look not just at detainees but those with asylum claims and refugee claims, unaccompanied children claims. And so the IJC is uh, spending a lot of its time uh, on, uh, on non-detained uh, cases. And um, the uh, organizations within the study, in the study group uh, of immigrant representation at, that I started, um, spending a lot of time focusing on issues having to do with uh, uh, non-detainees. Uh, I think the the uh, the point really that you're you're getting at is that uh, there are a lot of people with worthy claims, and uh, we should try to make sure that they don't slip through through the cracks. And that's a point that I've made um, repeatedly. And similarly, as we're dealing with unaccompanied children, very important. Uh, issue, obviously. Um, let's not lose sight of those who've had cases that are in the pipeline, uh, making sure that they get processed um, expeditiously. And, and um, so I, I, I fully agree with you that uh, uh, there needs to be more to be done. And uh, we hope that, for example, 
with respect to the Immigrant Justice Corps that will have a combination of public and private uh, support um, training these lawyers go to work for places like NILAG, go to work for the, or and we have lawyers in the IJC who are working in ver for various providers that are part of your coalition. And so that model, I think, can work and uh, needs further support. So your question really is a great plug for giving more resources to what <laughs> we're trying to do. Michael? Uh, hi, Michael Cooper. I'm active in the immigration field for the New York City Bar Association. My question is sort of along the same lines. I mean, first of all, I want to congratulate you for all that you've contributed in this field and say as well that it's been encouraging over the last few years to see federal government, state government, city government, um, foundations, private sector stepping forward, the pro bono bar stepping forward to address these needs. Um, at the same time, it seems to me that there's a little bit of a tension between a sort of a needs-based approach to the problem and a rights-based approach to the problem. So we're helping these people because they have a need for a lawyer, not necessarily because they have a right to a lawyer. And so one of the observations has been that this has created a good deal of tension over specifically these kinds of issues. So uh, as a lawyer, do you invest 100 hours in a very difficult case that you know you will lose, or in 10 rather easy cases that you'll probably win? And you have to sort of balance those things. So I wonder if you could just address the, this issue of uh, sort of a needs-based approach versus a rights-based approach to the problem and how we make decisions about whom in the community we can and can't serve. I mean, that's a great question. I, I don't operate on that lofty plane. Uh, I'm just concerned about making sure that people have lawyers. And um, it's, it's um, uh, you know, it's difficult. For example, um, if you want to get um, lawyers, let's say pro bono lawyers uh, from firms, uh, working on um, some cases involving asylum cases, um, because of the backlog in the courts, even though you're going to win, it could take years and years. And, and uh, um, so there has to be that commitment to be, able to, to be willing to stick with that case. And I'd like to find ways to streamline that process so that, uh, and that's a resource question, um, um, so that it, 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 it becomes easier for lawyers to pursue all these uh, cases. Um, um, I think what's striking is, you know, if, if in these asylum cases in New York, 74%, if you have a lawyer, you have a successful outcome. What does that tell you about uh, the worth of these, the merits of these cases when 74 percent uh, if you have a lawyer. And if you don't have a lawyer, it's, it's 13 percent. So um, uh, you know, lawyers have to balance how they spend their time. And it's not for me to say um, how to spend their time. I just want everyone to pitch in to do, to do his or her part. Thank you. 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 So I guess it's obvious that, particularly in the public safety field, nothing is more important than trying to protect those that are the most vulnerable members of our community, and particularly when it comes to kids and families. So, Judge, I heartily congratulate you. And NILAG, I know the great work you're doing around this issue. Please keep it up. Thank you all. We have our annual event on December 1st. We're honoring Howard Milstein, Commissioner Bratton, and uh, retiring Congresswoman McCarthy. I expect to see you all there. We will be taking attendance at the door, um, so check in early and often. Thank you all. We'll see you then.